Good evening. My name is Mike Narragon, and I serve on the board of the Mount Lebanon Historical Society. The Mount Lebanon Historical Society, in partnership with the library and the school district, have teamed up to sponsor the faculty speaker series, and I celebrate this collaborative relationship. A few brief housekeeping items to note and put on your calendar. I'm sure you all received a flyer on the way in. Uh, this is about the Saturday, December 7th, uh, stories from social justice leaders representing a wide variety of communities. So I call this to your attention. This promises to be simply awesome. Uh, this is, a, this is a, an amazing array of folks who are going to speak with you that evening. And the second one is on Thursday, April 23rd at 7 p.m., George Savaris will man this podium speaking on structural changes in international relations and posing topics the primary and general election candidates should address. So please make note of that. Thursday, April 23rd at 7. These faculty-led talks have always been provocative. Last year, members of the Mount Lebanon science faculty prodded us to think about the dynamic ways in which artificial intelligence and machine learning have started to transform our work lives, political systems, and our sense of humanity. Tonight's scheduled speaker met with an unavoidable conflict, but do not fear, we are still in for a treat. Coming in from the intellectual bullpen is none other than Pete DiNardo. I have the distinct pleasure of counting Pete DiNardo as among my friends, a friendship that now spans decades. And he is familiar to many of us this evening because he is one of our community's leading public intellectuals. Last year, Pete delivered a series of talks that invited us to think about the lives of civil rights activists, such as Medgar Evers, Rosa Parks, and Martin Luther King Jr., who troubled the waters and took courageous actions in the face of hatred and opposition, actions designed to provoke and stir others into dialogue, discussion, and debate. They sought to generate conflict and create disturbances. And through this process, they hope to energize others, much like Pete always does, to move people, to build compassionate communities, and to heal the social and economic fissures in our societies. Tonight's talk represents a further outgrowth and extension of these earlier investigations. Pete and I undertook an amazing study tour this past summer, and we followed the footsteps of civil rights activists throughout the American South. On this journey, Pete began to think deeply about Martin Luther King Jr.'s concept of the beloved community and the, and the connections of the beloved community to his teaching units on civil liberties and the tragic event a little more than a year ago at the Tree of Life. Pulling together these divergent strands prodded Pete into action, and he looked for ways to take the concepts behind the beloved community and generate conversations about how to bring these principles alive in Mount Lebanon. Acting on these convictions, Pete delivered a version of this talk at Bethel in September, and he helped organize a community-wide discussion held at the library this past October 30th. As with Pete's other talks, tonight's discussion of free speech in an age of extremism and anxiety ought to trouble our waters and force us to think and to grapple with complex issues while, pro while, pro uh, excuse me, while provoking and providing intellectual space for multiple views. Tonight's talk, along with the previous conversations at Bethel and the library, runs parallel to the other work being done by high school social studies students and the department in our very community, their collective efforts designed to build a Lebo version of the beloved community. I cannot, cannot thank Pete enough for taking the time, energy, and care to lead us on this journey and to provoke us to think. And I welcome him to the podium. Pete. Mike, thank you. As always, our friendship uh, never ceases to wonder me, and I appreciate your kind words. Good evening, and thank you for being here tonight. I'm especially impressed, considering that there are two Pittsburgh football games going on in an hour. And though not the intended speaker, I am what you get, and hopefully it'll be worth your time. I begin by telling you that I will present some disturbing and difficult and offensive topics. First, please take care of yourself, and if you need to exit at any time, please do so. Words matter. I, I get tingles when I hear the speeches of Dr. King, and I can be moved to action by similar orders. 
We equally know that words hurt. The adult who disparages a child can induce either major or minor trauma. We know, too, that we live in an age of extremes and polarization, and an age in which we do not listen well and sometimes presume and project meaning inaccurately. This image most of you are familiar with, and there's a lot of wrong things that went on on that day and in the presumptions and the aftermath of that event. But before we go too deep into the difficult stuff, let's look at some of the familiar. In 1989, California banned the Lorax. This is my favorite book of all time because I speak for the trees. They banned the Lorax because it was in a logging community. That logging community found it troubling when their fathers came home from work and their children asked, Daddy, why are you cutting down the trees? A couple of years ago, in 2014, in Toronto, a patron asked to take Hop on Pop off the bookshelves because it encouraged violence against fathers. <laughs> More to our liking here, the novel Huck Finn has tremendous reason to ask questions, and yet classic deep value here. Perhaps we would agree that students uh, holding this sign, Bong Hits for Jesus, is appropriately banned when it's on a school-sanctioned moment watching the Olympic torch relay. So there might be some times that we agree with the court. This was a 5-4 decision in which the court felt that the school had the right to sanction these students. Let's come up to the recent past. Connecticut, just uh, a couple of weeks ago. A Connecticut law bans anyone who ridicules or holds up to contempt a person or group because of creed, religion, color, denomination, nationality, or race. Violators can be jailed for 30 days and fined for $250. What happened was two young white men were walking along and playing a stupid game, as young men tend to do. And they started to sing a vulgar version of a racist term for African Americans. Unbeknownst to them, uh, someone was videotaping them. That went on to social media, and the two men were arrested. The difficulty legally comes in that their words were not directed at anyone. Nobody was physically harmed. And we would wonder what the decision would have been if they were using the word but singing a rap song. Moreover, the law in Connecticut is ancient and rather vague. So the issue is tremendously up in the air. Harvard, just uh, in September. The Harvard Crimson, its known journal, uh, was writing an article on a group called Abolish ICE. They went and asked ICE, the in, uh, Immigration and Customs Enforcement Agency, for uh, their comment on the story. The students involved in a, an effort to protect uh, undocumented and documented uh, immigrants found that the reaching out to ICE itself was a violation of student trust. They described it as cultural insensitivity, blatantly endangering undocumented students on campus. Their concern was that ICE has had its moments of seeking out individuals and exploiting circumstances. The quotation on the right you have, uh, that's from the Daily Mail title. The National Review asked if the PC mob took over. The Daily Mail has an interesting term that is also offensive in many ways but Snowflake is someone maybe who is too sensitive. Is it overly sensitive? Is it coddling, as Jonathan Haidt would say? Or is this an effort to include and expand the concept of inclusion and respect? Throughout my 30 years of teaching, one constant compelling question that I have had is how can a multicultural society live in harmony? In its ideal, we affirm pluralism and tolerance. But as recognized by James Madison in Federalist 10, factions, groups, cliques, tribes are natural, and they cannot be dissolved in many ways. We look to the last half century. We know over the last 50 years, we have had a degree of tribal identity. We had the beautiful rights movement that Mike referenced that expanded individual liberty. We had the affirmation of individual rights from the left that was uh, joined by the right in the 80s for economic liberty. We've had the economic disturbances of 45 years. We've had a backlash to equality. All of this tells us there's a couple of competing trends, hyper-individualism and hunkering down in our tribes. But the tribes are natural. 
The tribes are natural, as Sebastian Younger points out, and as Jonathan Haidt points out. It's not abnormal to have tribal instincts, but those tribal instincts can, in fact, lead to some negative actions here. I find this interesting because we tend to be very presentist. So when I talk about this individualism, I want you to look at this 1907 article. Apparently, we've been struggling with the cult of me for well over a century. So it might not be something that is merely 40 years old. We also know of these approaches here. My favorite one is the short one in the middle, the disuniting of America. Schlesinger explored the, the concern. He affirmed the multicultural movement, but he wondered about what happens when we spread ourselves so far and we don't have something common that binds us. So I think I get the idea that some are expressing for a common chord, for an identity that's shared in common. But then I think about our trip that Mike and I mentioned. All of you should recognize on the left one of the most sacred places, the Edmund Pettus Bridge. John Lewis, Martin Luther King, Amelia Boynton, and others who were beaten for the right to vote on that bridge. One mile from that to the right is that obelisk dedicated to Nathan Bedford Forrest. Nathan Bedford Forrest is celebrated as a, a cavalry officer. He's better known for being one of the founders of the Klan for ordering the execution of surrendering troops at Fort Pillow. There are many markers to Nathan Bedford Forrest. This particular one, though, was put up in 2000. Not in 1880, not in 1900, not in 1920. Why 2000? Selma had its first black mayor elected. So we have expressions of identity that may conflict with our universal values. While I'm not confident that there aren't wrong answers in what we hear today, I am equally confident that there are a lot of right versus right issues. And I'm equally confident that we need more dialogue more than debate. So I struggled with conceptualizing the talk and probably should have made it into a five-part series. But I hope what I put together here will explore some divisive issues in a productive way. What I'd like to do is first present some theories, secondly go to some Supreme Court uh, decisions and perspectives. I'll move into offensive feelings or respect look at hate, and then hopefully explore some solutions. So let me present this. Richard Delgado and his wife, um, in the, about 35 years ago, established this book. They've edited it again. What they're looking at is a desire for a reinterpretation of free speech and the idea that there should be limits on hate speech. They draw on numerous studies of the deep psychological impact that speech can have, the historic tendency to equate and create cultural images of inferiority. They argue against the age you and I live in of unfettered free speech, particularly its damages to underrepresented and marginalized and disempowered people. You can see some of the studies that they've cited here. They're worried that unfettered free speech inhibits and undermines the 14th Amendment's Equal Protection Clause. And they cite that free speech can lead to actual violence. Just to give you a sense here. Meritor Savings Bank from 33 years ago. This case involved a female employee, uh, Michelle Vinson, who sued because the vice president of the bank, she alleged, had conducted sexual harassment and sexual uh, assault on her. She um, uh, identified numerous moments. He claimed they were all consensual. The Supreme Court took up the case and came to the conclusion that Title VII of this 1964 um, Civil Rights Act was not uh, to be applied only to economic discrimination, but to the totality of discrimination. And they assert that words alone can establish an environment of sexual harassment. It was a unanimous decision. That unanimous decision said those words create a hostile work environment. They later would apply that to race. So with that, we asked the interesting question that was in the news a few weeks ago about a young African-American student at, an all, uh, at, at a Catholic high school who was leaving a course on, dis, on social justice as a young man starts to sing lyrics from R. Kelly, Bump and Grind. And she looked at him and said, we've just been discussing issues of justice. And his answer was that 
I know that he may be a pedophile, but I like his music. And she felt as an African-American woman, hearing those words, he was creating an environment that was uncomfortable for her. Delgado's views are contrast, contrasted with Nadine Strossen. Some of you may know her from her three decades with the ACLU. Her book is equally compelling in my mind. She does most of her work comparing Europe and the United States. In Europe, there are far more many restrictions on free speech. And she finds that those restrictions lead to unintended consequences, that they don't liberate and they don't reduce violence, but they actually may create far more problems there. Her answer would simply be more speech. So if we go from those two theories, we then go to the Supreme Court. We know that no right we have is absolute. There is none of the, no, no uh, right in the Bill of Rights is infinite. Everything can be limited. In speech, we look at it this way. Free speech may be limited for any of these major reasons, so long as the government can establish a compelling interest. Most of this was established about 100 years ago in the Schenck case. That's the first major case that we refer to in which the Supreme Court issued its clear and present danger doctrine, that you can't falsely shout fire in a crowded movie theater. That stood for about half a century, that we could limit speech. In mid-60s, that shifts. The case was Brandenburg. Brandenburg v. Ohio, some repugnant views, uh, Klansmen, white, white uh, nationalist, and uh, a neo-Nazi. The court here shifts the bar that speech can only be punished where such advocacy is directed to inciting or producing imminent lawless action and is likely to incite or produce such action. So away from clear and present danger to imminent lawless action. And that leads to the famous case that you probably know about, or the adults do, that the Skokie decision in 1977. It's fascinating, right? This is a town that was a, uh, 50 to 60 percent Jewish, and a, a white supremacist effort, the Nazis, want to march there. A significant minority of that Jewish population were survivors of the Holocaust. Clearly, we could ask whether the presence of the Nazis there would cause trauma. The Supreme Court upheld their right to march. The march never took place. That's secondary. But what I do think might be creative for us is this, is the creative energy and voice of the community. So two things happen that I think demonstrate people's voting with their feet, if you will. Uh, the local Jewish community decided to create a Holocaust memorial and museum and that stands to today. So they decided that they would fight speech with speech. And then others left the ACLU for defending the Nazis here. These decisions reel the ascension of free speech over that of, say, Robert Bork in the upper left, the federal judge who once was nominated for the Supreme Court. Bork argued in favor of a narrow reading of free speech that would protect only purely political speech. He defined that explicitly political speech as criticisms of public officials or public policy, and scientific or moral discourse that, quote, directly feeds the democratic process. More debatable, he argued that the sexual revolution of the 60s and the rise of feminism led to a dangerous social and moral decline in the United States. And because speech did not protect non-political speech, he was very willing to set limits on pornography and television film, nasty words, et cetera. In contrast, the other three men uh, offer us the free trade in ideas. The nice mustache up there is Oliver Wendell Holmes. He's the one who, after the clear and present danger, starts to discuss we should have the free trade in ideas, the competition of the market, the marketplace of ideas. And there's a gentleman in the lower right, Louis Brandeis, that gives us the quintessential statement. In 1927, um, he wrote in the Whitney versus California case, that our framers knew that order cannot be secured merely through fear of punishment for its infraction. Fear breeds repression, repression breeds hate, hate menaces stable government. The founders eschewed silence coerced by law. If there be time to expose through discussion the falsehoods and fallacies to avert the evil by the processes of education, the remedy to be applied is more speech not enforced silence. 
So we now end the wonky sort of philosophical and legal part, and we now turn to perceptions, feelings, and less clear imminent threats. I'll spend the rest of the time giving you examples to try and decide where we should be on the free speech spectrum here. Hurting feelings and less clear examples of imminent danger. It's an image we all know. Some would consider it offensive. We understand the NFL is a private entity. The limits on them is different than a government. But we also know this. In 1974, the Supreme Court declared that you cannot limit a person from placing the peace sign on a flag, which is considered a desecration of the flag. We can see the other examples here. Up until the 60s, the flag was a sign of deep patriotism. This is Abby Hoffman, the most famous yippie, wearing the flag as he goes to uh, speak in front of HUAC. And he says, I don't believe HUAC is patriotic, and I'm going to demonstrate that the left is more patriotic and wear this. In 1976, on the cover of Hustler, you have a flag-draped bikini. All this is interesting because it all violates the flag code. The flag code would ban using it in clothing. The flag a code bans using the flag on napkins. And who among us hasn't wiped our, our mouth at the July 4th party with a patriotic napkin there? So I think we struggle because this all gets to intended content. And then we ask the question about whether kneeling in front of a sacred symbol is considered wrong, but profiteering on it is OK. So then we go to the most famous case of the flag. Texas versus Johnson. This case involved Gregory Lee Johnson in 1984 at the Republican National Convention in Dallas. He and his colleagues that were on the far left opposed the Reagan administration's foreign policies. So they are marching and, and they develop some rather primitive chants, but somebody grabs a flag, throws it on the ground and douses it with kerosene and he sets it on fire. No one is hurt, no one was threatened. But Johnson was arrested, charged, and convicted of violating a Texas law that made it a crime to desecrate a, 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 a venerable object. At the time, 47 of 50 states had violated desecrating the flag. He was given a one-year jail sentence and a $2,000 fine. The Supreme Court overturned that conviction in a close five to four vote. The government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea offensive or disagreeable. We went to an effort to have a federal ban on it. That was struck down. There have been at least six times to try and have an amendment to ban desecrating the flag. It's passed the House a number of times, but it's never passed the Senate. In that moment, though, we have then the dissenting voices. John Paul Stevens on the left and William Rehnquist on the right. Both of them felt that the flag was a sacred object. Stevens, the case has nothing to do with disagreeable ideas. It involves disagreeable conduct that diminishes the value of an important national asset. Rehnquist, this is not the expression of an idea. It is the equivalent of an inarticulate grunt and most likely to be indulged in not to express any particular idea but to antagonize others. The First Amendment does not guarantee the right to employ every conceivable method of communication at all times and in all places. Since that moment, we've expanded the concept of free speech in various ways. Money is speech. Cakes are speech. And in this case, I'd wonder whether Robert Bork would be torn in this case because a cake is not political discourse and conservative columnist George Will said so. But he definitely would have sought the issue as gay marriage as part of the moral decline of America. So I'm not sure how Bork would have come down on this one. We continue to expand speech by allowing insulting terms, some perhaps taken back to be empowering. We know this, that trademarks are a major part of a capitalist society. We have the Lanham Act. The Lanham Act uh, limits disparagement negative belittling terms that cause um, injury. So I was thinking in preparing this about this, this image. Bloomingdale's. Hawk and bras by using a sacred symbol. Uh, it's freedom and liberty. Liberty, love it, right? It's great. So we can laugh at that one. What about this one? 
the same symbol, expressive speech, well, my students often say, that's not acceptable. It's 1971 at the height of debate over Vietnam, and it's one perspective on what liberty is. Well, the case of uh, the Lanham Act and disparagement became quite famous in 2017 with the slants. The slant is a uh, derogatory term for Asians, and they sued. It took uh, Simon and Tam many, many years to win this lawsuit. But the idea that they argued was that they could reappropriate and empower the term. They found, according to conversations with him and, and his uh, lectures, that young Asian kids found empowerment through their music, which is not bad, it's not great, but it's not bad, and their opposition uh, to the term. What do you think this is? It's a group that wanted to be called Dykes on Bikes, lesbian motorcyclists. The Trademark uh, Commission forbade that as a disparaging term. They lost in the first round. In appeal, they won. And their argument was they wanted to show that being female can be also being tough and masculine, I perhaps guess, right? And they convinced them that the word dyke is not offensive to the lesbian community. A term that sounds very nasty, just last year, won the right to have his clothing apparel here. Iancu versus Brunetti, a unanimous decision. So we're seeing a major shift. And yet, the term Quran wine would be offensive to Muslims. And that has been acceptable to limit. A term that definitely evokes some problems. Acceptable. And now after TAM and the uh, 18 decision, the team from Washington will likely be able to keep its symbol despite some historic problems with that. So I find ourselves on a continuum somewhere between coddling, microaggression, and triggering. So let's turn now to what happens for a lot of the kids here in high school, and then we'll get to college. We know the classic case of Mary Beth Tinker challenging with her uh, sibling and friends Symbolic speech, the right to wear the armband she is holding. That's a nice little picture when I met her a couple of years ago in the lower corner. Just a shout out for that. Um, and uh, we know this, that students do not give up all their rights when they enter school, but they don't have all rights. So here, maybe hard to see, but on the left, the school prohibited a 10th grade student from wearing a t-shirt that expressed his opposition to being gay. Be ashamed, our school embraced what God has condemned. Homosexuality is shameful, it's handwritten. Can a principal ban him from wearing this? This case went to the, to the district courts and uh, he was ordered to take it off. They challenged it, both the Ninth Circuit and the Supreme Court upheld the school's decision. What was interesting is this, the court decision did not say there was any impact. This is one kid wearing this. There wasn't trauma-induced impact by somebody who was, to, to someone who was gay. But they said here, it's enough that for the court that as an abstract matter, the message was, quote, a verbal assault that may destroy the self-esteem of our most venerable, vulnerable teenagers. He wore it on the day of silence, so he wanted to cause a ruckus. The year before, the school had had some conflicts on the day of silence, and so the court upheld it. The shirt on the right, though, Nixon versus Northern Local School District, it has a similar message here. In this case, the court overturned the decision to not let this um, shirt be worn because, quote, it was an invasion of rights of others. All right? You couldn't prove that. Here we have what's happening in San Francisco at a school, murals on the wall that, find, that some students and some adults find deeply troubling and offensive. According to some adults, these are violent images that are offensive to certain communities. It's uh, primarily George Washington, and he's seen conquering um, uh, Native Americans. Intent no longer matters. The murals glorify the white man's role and dis dismiss the humanity of other people who are still alive. It's not worth, one said, saving art if one Native student is triggered by that. These two shirts. It looks like it's coming in a little bit blurry there, I'm sorry. Uh, on the left is a, a, a young person who wore a shirt, be happy, not gay. The school uh, forced her to, to cross off the not gay part. 
the district court upheld the right of the school to limit this because it, it was a pedagogical concern. The shirt on the right, all the cool girls are lesbians. This was clearly a principal's personal position. So he had felt that the kid was espousing a, quote, political view that he said would be offensive to some people. So in this case, this young woman actually has become quite an activist. Uh, in this case, uh, the principal probably, well, definitely went beyond the pale because he went to personal views. This case, Dariano versus Morgan Hill, involves whether young men can wear uh, on Cinco de Mayo American flag shirts and, fla and shirts that uh, counter the Mexican-American kids wearing uh, Mexican flags and shirts that had pride for Mexico. Uh, again, in this case, the school officials felt it was reasonable to limit the boys in the upper part, the ones who wanted to wear the American flag shirts, because it was creating an environment that would interrupt the school day. The Supreme Court refused to hear the appeal. So is it ever possible for a student's words and writings alone to invade the rights of others? Well, I worry because students are targets. Uh, we could, I'm sorry, we can ask about this question too, how much this would disturb people. Students are targets. Uh, I'll come back to Andrew Anglin, but the Daily Stormer, one of the most dangerous websites, targets teens. In his words, my site is mainly designed to target children for radicalization. He approaches kids age 11 through teen years, young adults, pubescents. White men naturally want this. Our goal has to be to give this ideology to teenagers and even before teenagers. And his use of memes is designed, quote, in his words, to indoctrinate children into sharing their belief. So there is a reason that we worry about our youth and ideas that could be problematic. At colleges, we have similar debates. In 1964, the free speech movement was born at Berkeley, Mario Savio. In the 70s, the court upheld the right of the uh, Students for a Democratic Society in Healy, and then for a much more salacious uh, newspaper article in 1973. According to the court, state colleges and universities are not enclaves immune from the sweep of the First Amendment. A college or university may not restrict speech or association simply because it finds the view expressed by any group to be abhorrent. Judge Powell, Justice Powell, spoke for the marketplace of ideas. But again, in this case, two justices dissented, Warren Berger and Justice Rehnquist, they assert that it is absolutely within the university's role and responsibility to teach students, quote, to express themselves in acceptable civil terms. This leads us to the 80s and 90s and a whole lot of speech codes, 300 plus of them at universities that often didn't meet uh, the full test in court. But if we go to the place in colleges, I hope that we might agree that when college fraternities are reveling in blackface, discussing Christmas parties, draping Confederate banners, and a noose around the one African American in the fraternity, having Halloween lynching parties, or having the Oklahoma fraternity sing and film that disgusting uh, ditty, that it's okay that we would say that's dangerous. Just like we would ask about this fraternity. This is at the mo uh, marker for Emmett Till. You may not be able to see it from a distance, but the 14-year-old boy who was brutally uh, murdered and lynched in 1955 has had a state marker for a little over a decade, and it gets shot up every now and then. Just a few months ago, it was cleaned up, a new one put up that's in bulletproof glass. But these kids are fraternity kids that think it's gonna be funny to go and take a picture. They didn't, sh we have no evidence that they shot at this marker. But it certainly appears that they are either taking this far too lightly or glorifying in the assault on this uh, reputation and on this marker. So then we'd ask clearer threats. Do these create an atmosphere of intimidation? If you have a black doll that is hung by a noose and you have uh, simulated lynchings, and you have bananas displayed at American University with racist commentary on it. Are you creating, then, 
and in, a, 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 an offensive and endangering environment for those students. Here's what students think. I'll let you look at this. 71% of, uh, I'm sorry, of freshmen surveyed in the fall of 2016 agreed with the statement. Colleges should prohibit racist and sexist speech on campus. 43%. Colleges have the right to ban extreme speakers from campus. We're moving on college campuses to an acceptance of this. And it might be to create what just today I was reading, more empathy. You can see here that it varies on what topic you want, but depending on the generation, and you can place yourself in those, you know your generation. This is our high school kids today. Uh, you can see where you fall between whether Muslim clergy, racists, uh, gay folks, communists should be allowed to speak or not. And you can see that there's a slight change in some, but you see there's a great difference depending on the content being expressed. The court generally doesn't like it when we say content should be limited. Similarly, just look at a short time here. You can see an increase in wanting to prohibit speech at certain places. One more. If we go here then, we ask these questions here. Some college theater groups are refusing to perform the vagina monologues because it excludes women without vaginas and thus offends the transgendered. One professor at a liberal arts college, a three-tour three veteran of, uh, of Iraq, was lectured about patriarchy for using the phrase man up. At Cal State in 2014, the InterVarsity Christian Fellowship, an evangelical Christian organization with more than 900 chapters nationwide, was disciplined because it required students who joined to affirm their faith. The university has an all-comers policy. The Supreme Court upheld it. In 2016, college Republicans at a Catholic university, DePaul, placed this sign up. Vincentian father, that the Vincentian father who leads DePaul, uh, condemned it as bigotry. We refuse to allow members of our community to be subjected to bigotry that occurs under the cover of free speech. And then on Emory's campus. The stairs, if you can see them, say, are painted Trump, 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 Trump. This is just before the 2016 election. And students went to the university president saying that they're, um, they're expressing their, quote, fear and frustration because the platform of Donald Trump undermines Emory's values. You know that universities have been struggling with the concept of guest speakers. These are uh, left and right supporters of uh, various speakers from Middlebury to University of California. Some of the names that you know, uh, Milo and Richard Spencer, both are provocateurs. They both like to, to create um, con contested views. Spencer was uh, part of the founding of the Unite the Right rally in Charlottesville. Uh, Ann Coulter, interesting, this is right at uh, uh, the UC campus that Mario Savio um, had started the free speech movement, so people were discussing, is this kind of odd that Ann Coulter is being challenged at a place that created free speech? Well, I found this interesting because there was a nice article written. What might Mario Savio have said about the Milo protest at Berkeley, right? And I found it interesting because I, I didn't know this until I read this guy's article. He had written a biography on Savio. Savio endorsed the idea of free speech, and he endorsed the idea that it had to be civil. We think of him as this radical that's on top of a car shouting. But he wanted us to hear each other. And I don't think we're doing that. We're not even coming close to doing that. So what's been happening? Well, the Justice Department has gone after the University of Michigan for its biased response team. A number of state governments, mostly controlled by Republican state legislatures, has set up new rules for speech on campus in response to these concerns. In Wisconsin, for example, after three times of interrupting a speaker, a speaker, you will be expelled. So we see a lot of concerns about people on the political left limiting the rights of speech. But the right has its own. In Pennsylvania, in fact, in 2015, the speaker pro temp, Joe Scarnati, sought to get Penn State to with withdraw the invitation to William Ayers. Uh, he's a former member of the Weather Underground who was under a lot of contested uh, status a few years ago. But he was invited to speak on campus. He had been connected with some radical causes. Should he be allowed to speak? Similarly, 
uh, Goddard College in 2014 had invited by uh, satellite Mumia Abu Jamal to speak. A lot of contested uh, experience. He's in jail convicted of the uh, murdering of a police officer. A lot of debate around the case. But should the university be allowed to bring in radical speakers? So I see the left and the right perhaps guilty of similar things. Then my next question is, if we're in an age of free speech, should you be allowed to deny the Holocaust? So we know in Europe, this is much more punishable than in the United States. And Europe has sued and won cases quite often for people who deny the Holocaust. Some of you know that Mahmoud, uh, um, uh, Mahmoud uh, Ahmadinejad of Iran uh, describes the Holocaust as a myth and a construct of, uh, uh, of Jewish uh, invention here. In the United States, when I was younger, Bradley Smith in the 80s and 90s decided that he would begin an organization to go after college kids. So in the 80s and 90s, he started a group called Committee for Open Debate on the Holocaust. Well, who's against open debate? There is no open debate on the Holocaust. It happened. You don't say there are two sides to this. But he was framing it as a free speech and inquiry idea. He would try to get um, advertisements in college newspapers, got them in a dozen, that would ask kids to participate in, in some experiments. He claimed that he had sent a questionnaire to 2,000 scholars, show me one proof that the Holocaust happened. And he claims no one returned or gave him evidence. So he's suggesting that the Holocaust is a fraud. Wonderful. So why in 1987, why student newspapers? Because he said, I don't want to spend time with adults anymore. I want to go to students. They are superficials, superficial. They are empty vessels to be filled. It's quite an insulting view of the young. In 2000, the Southern Poverty Law Center identified 10 Holocaust deniers teaching in American universities. In 2015, they uh, reasserted that number and uh, identified some of those names. So should academic freedom allow on a campus the teaching that the Holocaust did not happen? Can we teach that which is fact factually not true? Well, at the high school level, a high school principal in Florida argued we have to. So he, you can see what he says here, he's arguing that he won't stop a teacher from teaching that the Holocaust didn't happen because he can't take a political position on this. This is one of the most insane positions I could imagine. Not, surprising, not surprisingly, the uh, principal was removed from his duty. So we wonder about this because the denial of the Holocaust troubles me deeply when we have concerns from studies that the Holocaust is fading from memory. One third of Americans think that, quote, substantially less than six million Jews were murdered in the Holocaust. 41% of millennials think only two million. Two thirds of American millennials surveyed cannot identify Auschwitz. 22% of millennials in the poll seven, said they have not heard of the Holocaust. If one out of five had never heard of this, we need to be deeply concerned. And you can no notice this is a little dated, it's only 2017, about the number of anti-Semitic incidents that have been rising here. High school campus, black principal, anti-Semitic, uh, a group of teenagers did stupid things, they were drinking beer and they decided let's pull a high school prank and this is what they did. And uh, they got caught. They were masked, but they got caught. And kids should pay attention to this. Because as soon as they entered campus, the Wi-Fi on their phones clicked on. And though they were there at 11.30 at night, campus technology had the evidence of the four kids that were on campus. So be careful. We are watching always. This is a, universe, a Columbia University scholar on the Holocaust. And she came into her office hallway with this painted there. So I think that there is deep concern with any sense that we should just not worry about Holocaust denial. So we've moved there from freedom of speech. Let's go to freedom to hate. This is Fred Phelps, the founder of Westboro Baptist. 
The church began formally in 1991 and claims that it has, it has had nearly 50,000 demonstrations. Most of you might know that its primary opposition was to gay rights, but it also uh, expressed often anti-Semitic views, uh, would distribute flyers, DVDs, would claim often that Jews killed Jesus. Most infamously, they're known for protesting at the funerals of veterans, saying that God's hatred of America is holy because of the vile uh, uh, practices that we sanction. The pictures on the right, I think, find are fascinating. They're from a 2007 uh, BBC documentary uh, about the most hated family in America. And what Lester Thoreau, the gentleman seated in the upper right uh, picture in the middle, wanted to do was find out about this family. And he was fascinated because they look completely normal when they're not at a demonstration here. Um, 11 of Fred Phelps' children, 13 children, have law degrees, that they have normal conversations, they wear shorts, they wear normal clothing, they spend a lot of time together. Of those four, uh, of those 13 rather, four of the children have left the family. They've gone to Britain to protest, they've gone to Canada to protest, they've uh, protested at a showing of rent uh, in uh, Newport Beach, but the most famous protest they did was uh, in 2006 in Maryland at uh, Marine Lance Corporal Matthew Snyder's funeral. He had been killed in Iraq. They held up signs that God says, God, thank God for dead soldiers, God hates you, etc. The soldier's family sued. They sued for defamation, for invasion of privacy, and for inflicting emotional distress. At first, the family won a $5 million settlement at um, the, the district court level. Westboro challenged to the Supreme Court. And in the case of Snyder versus Phelps in 2011, in eight to one, John Roberts writing the opinion, uh, the right to hate won. According to Roberts, as a nation, we have chosen to protect even hurtful speech on public issues to ensure that we do not stifle public debate. He said the protesters followed the law. They didn't break a law. And quote, any distress occasioned by Westboro's picketing turned on the content and viewpoint of the message conveyed rather than any interference with the funeral itself. It turned out the father said he didn't see them during the funeral, that he was only told about it afterwards. And I think that mattered to John Roberts. The one dissenter was Samuel Alito. Alito wrote a passionate dissent, dissent discussing the rights of the father simply a parent who wanted to bury his son in peace. And the father has experienced severe and lasting emotional injury. Alito, our profound national commitment to free and open debate is not a license for the vicious verbal assault that occurred in this case. That type of assault, quote, makes no contribution to public debate. Today, 43 states prohibit speaking and protesting at funerals. The federal government sets a 300 foot uh, distance you have to be from these funerals. You can't protest two hours before or after. And Pennsylvania is introducing a ban last year. Of course, channeling Justice Brandeis and Whitney with an answer is something more creative to Fred Phelps. Uh, this was the decision. Fred Phelps, for some reason, decided that the Foo Fighters were a problem and on his website declared that they were doing the wrong thing, that they should be singing about loyalty and obedience to God. The Foo Fighters had no idea who this guy was, but they decided to go and picket one of his pickets. So he was gonna be outside one of their concerts. They came and decided to, to play a song to the protesters. And it was a song that was a gay love song. So here they are, the protesters, and they sing a gay love song, and then they give this beautiful statement of full inclusion there. In 2014 at Texas A&M, there was a protest to uh, a gentleman who graduated from A&M that had died in war. And what they created was 650 people to be a maroon wall, they called it, to circle the funeral proceedings so that Westboro could not reach them. In 2016, Westboro went to Redondo Union High in California. One of the injured people of the attack in San Bernardino that you know of had been a graduate of Redondo. She had been shot but survived and she was a supporter of LGBTQ rights. Westboro said that they chose Redondo because, quote, 
from a Bible perspective, we love these children more than their parents do. We love those children more than the communities do because we're willing to, on, on our own time and our own dime, tell those children what the Bible says about their manner of life. Somewhere between six and eight Westboro uh, members showed up and met 150 young high school kids telling them that God loves everyone. So maybe speech countering speech is the way. So if we can now move to modern white supremacism and more direct connection to imminent violence. The Turner Diaries, one of the most vile texts that the nation has seen. This was written in 1978, not a well-written text, but it sets up an apop apocalyptic vision of the world in which the organization is fighting the system. Angry at what was called the Cohen Act, a law that would confiscate all weapons, selecting a Jewish surname for the collection of guns, um, and then displayed or depicted African Americans raping and haunting people and, 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 and Jewish control of uh, society. It sets up, really, the viewpoint of Richard Bowers. The ultimate scene, a truck bomb, kills over 700 people in a federal building. The order takes over California and unleashes its nuclear arsenal, launching them at New York City and Israel. And in the ultimate end, the lead character, Turner, will fly a plane into the Pentagon. Timothy McVeigh had read the Turner Diaries and carried out what was only fictional in reality. This vile conduct here expands into Christian identity and Aryan nations. We know this, that Identity Europa, which has rebranded itself the American Patriot Movement, is a fashionable effort on college campuses to tell us that the future belongs to us. Keep your diversity, we want identity. You have probably may have heard of Camus, not the well-known Camus, but the Frenchman who wrote The Great Replacement. This concept that white men are being replaced by others is not merely part of European history now, but part of the American construct too. And its array of hatred and its use of memes has been successful in convincing some people that this is happening. You can see billboards that are primarily up in the Northwest. This is mostly from the Northwest, but Tennessee also, in which we are asserting language that would offend many of us, but that is permissible when you pay for it. It comes into the mainstream at times, too. Tucker Carlson in January of this year opened a show saying, the biggest issue facing this country going forward, bigger than wars, bigger than GDP, is the collapse of families. Maybe we could discuss that, except his rationale for this is, the reason for the collapse is that some women now earn, out earn some men. Maybe it also connects with Representative Steve King, we can't restore our civilization with someone else's babies. In its most vile form, and it's, it's, it's form that doesn't, doesn't fear being outwardly racist. These images were pasted in uptown Mount Lebanon, the Patriot Front. It's much more explicit, much more provocative, much more uh, clear. Blood and Soil is its website. Where does this all come in? Well, the Christ Church shooter had adhere to the Great Replacement Theory. Part of this is interesting because it's connected to concerns of reduced sperm count and testosterone. Kathleen Bilou of the University of Chicago argues that everything is framed in the white power movement, everything is framed through reproduction and gender. The most concerning thing for them is falling birth rates. In the movement, there is even a discussion that maybe the right to vote for women should be revoked, and certainly the right to work. Misogyny, then, is an important red flag. We know this locally with George Sodini in 2009 in LA Fitness and the murder of three women there. We know this in 2014 with Elliot Roger in California, 140-page manifesto in which he railed against spoiled, stuck-up women. That manifesto became 
a mantra for many people. The gentleman in Toronto in 2018 that took his van through sidewalks killing mostly women uh, posted on Facebook before uh, lauding Elliot Roger, the incel rebellion has already begun. All hail Supreme Gentleman Elliot Roger. For those of you that, that, that don't know, the incel, re uh, incel movement is the involuntarily celibate, men who believe that their lives have been ruined by women who will not sleep with them. Scott Beerley, who killed two in a Tallahassee yoga studio, expressed sympathy with Mr. Roger uh, in an online video. In the 90s, when he was high school, he wrote, in high school, he wrote a novel in which he described, he called it The Rejected Youth. The hot ones all detest me, and I haven't a clue why. More and more, we see misogyny as a gateway drug for extremists. Andrew Anglin again. If you become the ultimate alpha male, some stupid B.I. will still ruin your life. He argues this. His site's anti-women content bolsters traffic, even as other hate sites lose traffic. Listen to his rationale. Incels are full of rage, and it is trivial to turn these guys into, and he uses a racist term for Jewish people, haters. Few people have ever personally had their life harmed by a Jew in a direct, personally observable sense. But every single breathing man has had it effed up by, by multiple selfish, scheming hookers, likely starting with their own mothers. That misogyny is a gateway to white supremacism, and much of this viewpoint is spread via the internet. So we struggle with this. Jonathan Haidt just recently put in the Atlantic as of Tuesday, this crisis that we're seeing in social media. There's no inevitable progress. Social media uh, opened up wonderful doors for discussion. It's a liberating technology, uh, and yet it's also had its countervailing negative elements. The rapidity he traces from the 2004 opening of Facebook that claimed it would make the world more open and connected evolved when you start to get ideas like the like button, Twitter and the retweet, the share button, in which stories now multiply in rapid succession, and there is no time to actually have thought or discussion. As Facebook started to have forms that read your content, messages can be sent your way. He argued that the Russian effort to in invade our own elections didn't begin in 2016, but in 2014. And he's suggesting that social media and democracy cannot coexist. What I find interesting is that white supremacists knew the internet would be a salvation. In 1983, George Dietz created Aryans Nations Liberty Net as a pro-American, pro-white, anti-communist network of true believers who serve the one and only God, Jesus the Christ, for Aryan patriots only. It was basically bulletin board system. Finally, he argued, this is 36 years ago, finally we're all going to be linked together at one point in time. Imagine, if you will, all the great minds of the patriotic Christian movement linked together and joined into one computer. Imagine any patriot in the country being able to call up and access these minds. You are in line with Aryan Nation's brain trust. It is here to serve the folk. The possibilities, he argued in 1984, have only been touched upon. In 1985, the Anti-Defamation League, 1985, wrote a report that argued white supremacists were using computer technology. 34 years ago, we were discussing this potential. Tom Metzger uh, came late in the computer game. He first exploited cable TV and the right to public access. 21 cities, um, uh, 60 some odd stations in which he was able to espouse his racist uh, values, even though he claims he's not a racist. Um, the Stormfront that occurred in 1996, launched by Don Black, Holocaust denial, anti-Semitism, neo-Nazi, Islamophobia. It's been banned in France, Germany, and Italy. Anglin, the Daily Stormer. This now, I think, is the, the main and dominant force here. Dylan Roof, the shooter at uh, Mother Emanuel, posted comments on the Daily Stormer. After the shooting, 
uh, at Mother Emanuel with the nine African American deaths. Uh, on Daily Storm, people post pictures of themselves in the bowl cut hair that Dylan Roof had, honoring him with that and memes. He wasn't the only one that read it, but Anglin's vicious attacks here have a style guide. Here's how you will get published. If we accept you for publication, we will pay you $14.88, and I'll get there in a minute. Generally, though, when using racial slurs, it should come across as half-joking. The un unindoctrinated should not be able to tell if we are joking or not. He goes on to say, it's obviously a ploy because I want to kill Jews. The goal is to continually repeat the same points over and over. The reader is at first drawn in by curiosity or by naughty humor and is slowly awakened to reality. And this is the red pill that the, the movement talks about. From the Matrix, you will come to discover the truth. One of it, this, this, man, this uh, style guide is rather, rather long. But one of the last points, blame Jews for everything. No pathology, no technology, no urbanization. Just blame Jews for everything. He started book clubs at bars and at gun clubs. And he orchestrates a troll army in which he, he has people go to docks and to, to uh, harass people. Uh, one of them, because he falsely accused the person of being responsible for the Manchester bombing that Ariana Grande was singing at, won a $4 million settlement. This woman, Tanya Gersh, had been doxxed. She and her husband are Jewish. The Spencers live in, in, or his mother lives in their community, and she raised questions about the mother of one of the leading white supremacists being in the community. So Anglin and his computer network targets her, her husband, and their family. He plasters their photographs with yellow stars all over his site. He identifies their phone numbers. He identifies their addresses. And he commands his readers, his stormer troll army, to, quote, hit him up. Her husband, at one point over a three-day period, received 500 calls. She received calls. All, you, all of you deserve a bullet through your skull. And they get more disgusting and more disgusting. She's a powerful woman who stood up to him. She won a $14 million settlement just last June. Where does all of this get to? It gets to Charlottesville. White lives matter. You will not replace us. Jews will not replace us. Blood and soil. Once when folks were isolated, they are now connected. And that connectivity brings them together in this most dangerous event and the death of Heather Heyer. But I worry, too. Because we know this, that they're targeting even online gaming. A lot of people game. They enjoy it. They find social connections. They find questions and friends. They enjoy this. If you have children, you should go read this op-ed piece in the New York Times. The targeting and the repetition of things is scary. The number 14, you'll see it on tattoos, you'll see it everywhere. We must secure the existence of our people in a future for white children. It's 14 words. 8-8, eight, eight, H is the eighth letter, Heil Hitler. The dice, one, four, five, three. These are symbols we wouldn't recognize if we're not aware of what's happening. Kathy Blee, a local scholar on uh, white supremacism, uh, has researched this and finds that gamers, 23% of gamers are targeted uh, with white supremacist content. And it's done in ways that draw one in and then gets you like Anglin does. But as the Supreme Court said, social media is the social medium. Social media in particular is now the most important place in a spatial sense for the exchange of views. So the Supreme Court has interestingly upheld in North Carolina the right for a uh, convicted uh, sex offender to not have to, to, uh, to be able to access computer sites. The decision there had a concurring opinion in which Alito writes, I wonder if we're too vague on this. If you look at the bottom tour, I was totally unaware of this until um, a year last October when we went to a uh, uh, First Amendment conference. Uh, the leader of Tor, Tor has uh, built software for privacy and freedom online. Uh, the woman who leads the project uh, claims that uh, the NSA could not hack into Tor. CMU did, but then they patched that up. This idea is a place that is full freedom of, uh, of expression. 
So this would be for whistleblowers because you can't track it. This would be for people who want to share views. When raised, we, somebody asked the question in the audience, well, does that mean that, say, the sale of opioids or child trafficking or anything else? And her answer was, it's not our responsibility. We're in a free and open market. The government should deal with its, deal, its, its issues and we'll deal with ours. How about just simple conspiracy theories? Alex Jones, Pizzagate, Parkland shooting being staged. We understand this, that ideas can do real harm. So you know, maybe you know that as of last year, the families of, uh, some of the families of the Sandy Hook uh, uh, victims are suing Alex Jones because of his claims that uh, this was a staged um, uh, massacre. Um, this woman has won a lawsuit uh, against Jones because of the attacks on him. Various sites have been banned in Europe. Gab's been banned in Europe. The founder of H-Chan believes that we should take it down. H-Chan has um, uh, allowed the trafficking of pornography, child porn, incels, name it, they've allowed it. Facebook is just debating whether they should allow the publication of certain things, et cetera. All of this comes to this act. So the Communications Decency Act was passed in the mid-90s as an effort to clean up parts of television. It was struck down partially in 1997, but Section 230 was allowed to exist. This is long before Zuckerberg was anything, right? This is long before the internet uh, came out into the public. This was a law passed that wanted to establish, and it was a response to uh, an effort to uh, lay claim for liability on a provider in New York State that was blamed for what was said there. It's allowed the flourishing of um, uh, social media sites. So social media sites are not considered um, uh, newspapers. They're not considered the press. They're considered a platform. So they're not responsible for what you write on it. So you can write lies, you can write hate, you can write threats. They're not responsible, in part because of this, because you wanted to give the freedom there. But I think what people miss is the second part. The second part, uh, there's more than this, but a, a, a key second clause, that you can't hell be, hell be held liable for a voluntary action taken in good faith to restrict access. So when the great media giants say, hey, we're not responsible, the law says you can try. In good faith, you're OK. The, one of the co-writers of this said, the act was meant to be both a shield and a sword for tech companies. And so what we're looking at here is an effort to say, should there be some limit of internet use of free speech people? The, the big tech giants are responding. They're starting to put some limitations on, although they're not all doing it, and that's a challenge for us. So in racing through all this, what do I see is to be done? I'm going to lay out a few ideas, and then we can have our questions and answer. First, I'd like to say this. I would like to, to borrow from one of my intellectual heroes, Dr. Martin Luther King. The book on the left is by C. Van Woodward, written 64 years ago, The Strange Career of Jim Crow. King called it the historical Bible of the civil rights movement. And by that, he meant Jim Crow didn't occur out of nature. It was man-made. If it's man-made, it could be man-unmade. So I think that's powerful because in the 1870s, the federal government became the custodian of freedom and crushed the Klan by law and by force. Perhaps, too, we can consider this. It's hard to see, but I think when we see all the anti-Semitism, there might be a ray of hope here. If you look at the, this is a survey done annually about feelings of warmth. What group of believers do Americans have the greatest warmth towards? Jewish Americans. And over the three years where we've seen the rise of anti-Semitic activity, we see in the majority of us hope rather than despair. Second, I would say we have to address culture. In such a polarized time, I don't think that's going to happen at the national level. But it might happen in communities. It might happen in schools. It might happen to just be the case that we need to teach our children well. They're not born into hate. They're drawn into it. 
Nick Kristoff had written the other day, we need, quote, a war on loneliness and disaffection. Jean Twinge, the scholar of uh, adolescence, uh, cited the general social survey a couple of years ago. The incredible fears that I would have because the number of adolescents that feel lonely. Maybe we need to connect these folks. Maybe on college campuses and in high schools, we need to move from safe spaces to some say brave spaces. But I like the argument that I read a few months ago saying what we need is safe enough spaces. It's an argument that's taken from a different movement. What we want is a safe enough space that you're also pressed to be uncomfortable. We want you to go to intellectually uncomfortable places. Brave Spaces says, maybe if we ask each other, what do you, f what do you fear? How can we find your dreams? Civility, really absent in our culture today. Um, at a Yom Kippur service I was at, uh, at uh, the JCC in Squirrel Hill, Rabbi Ron Simon cited um, Rabbi Prinz. Prinz was the, the final speaker before Dr. King spoke at uh, the March on Washington. And in his short speech, he mentioned this concept. Neighbor is not a geographical term. It is a moral concept. It means our collective responsibility for the preservation of man's dignity and integrity. And as we hunker down in our silos and we start to hang out with like-minded people, Maybe we can get that idea that we should be neighbors with those that are different than us, at least intellectually, if we can. That would involve deliberative dialogue. That would involve what Rabbi Myers from Tree of Life suggests. Just maybe we obliterate the word hate from our lives. Fascinating discussion over the summer covered in the New York Times. 530 Americans from all walks of life were brought to Texas for three days. And in a well-structured deliberative dialogue, they dis discussed every contested issue in America today. <clears throat> and every one of them came out of it and said, I've never had such an invigorating period of time in which people I disagree with, I could sit down and talk with. Perhaps we also need to not ignore the fringe. If we knew in the 80s that the internet was going to be weaponized, we got passive. We focused on the understandable threat of international terrorism, and we're really slow on domestic terrorism. Henry Louis Gates this past Sunday wrote a column discussing how in the period after the Civil War, we allowed a certain sect of Southerners to define the outcome of the war with the lost cause. And that led, that led to Jim Crow. William F. Buckley many years ago made it clear the John Birch Society was unacceptable to conservatism. We need gatekeepers like Buckley. Perhaps also law and precedent we need. Perhaps we need to revisit the expanded definition of free speech. Perhaps we need to go back and examine uh, group libel. Perhaps we need to consider civil lawsuits. Though civil lawsuits do suggest that government is less responsible and private actors will be most responsible. South Dakota had an interesting limit of free speech that was uh, then just rejected. South Dakota had passed a law called the Riot Boosting Act. The state could sue individuals and organizations for, quote, riot boosting, which is an odd term, right? This included if you gave the thumbs up to a protester, or if you gave money to a protester, or if you held up a sign on a street corner, or if you asked somebody to join a protest. What's all this about? It's about Keystone Pipeline and Native Americans protesting. So we see all sorts of challenges and limits there. But ultimately, what I would like to finish with is this. I've covered a lot of ground, hopefully in some sense of order and some link. I'm normally an optimist, but I stand here uncertain. Our nation and our world faces serious divisions. And to borrow from Lincoln, I think it is our, our great task. The choice to engage it is yours and mine to make. I don't think we can ignore this. I think we have to engage it with conviction. I thank you for your time, and if you have any comments or questions, I'll field them now. If anyone has a question, Mike, do you have the mic? Does anyone have a question or comment? Talk on free speech, no one wants to speak. 
Good. Uh, what would you say you think is the greatest threat to America's youth right now? Wow. Um, you know, um, I, I actually think that youth are more resilient than adults are. I think youth are more open-minded than youth, adults are. I have the great fortune to every week be inspired by youth. So my guess is this, that I think what I see as the sad reality is that I see anxiety as the greatest threat. And I get that because uh, the only generation I can think of that has been uh, raised in existential threats, 9-11, Columbine, sadly, another school shooting today, um, climate change threat, and no certainty about the economic future. So I would argue that the greatest threat is understanding reality <laughs> and uh, the anxiety that's induced there. Any other questions? What would you say about um, offensive uh, music containing like offensive lyrics or offensive messages to teenagers? Yeah. Um, so this is something that a lot of folks uh, you know, who are my age talk about, and kids may view it very differently. Uh, I, I am a little bit bothered by it. I know that may make me old as, you know, maybe in the, the generation before, people said the same thing. In the 60s, the same thing. And even the 20s, people said the same thing. But I look at this versus sort of questions about some debate about moral codes to language that I don't think can be appropriated. I think there are certain words that can't be turned like the word uh, the slants have done or like in the gay community, queer has done. I'm not sure that we can actually overcome some of the nasty legacy from certain words. So I'm not confident, but that's you know, a middle-aged white guy's view. So I'm not sure that that's going to be universal. If you ask me my personal views, um, it'd be nicer if we had. That's true on comedy shows, right? It's tough. You, you, you look on Netflix for comedy shows, and it's hard to find one that doesn't drop a lot of, a lot of curses. And I'm not a Puritan, but I think it's more difficult to figure out how not to do that. Anything else? Yes. Hey, Ms. Meyer. Shows at local colleges. Yeah. Because of the. Right. Uh, I, I don't know if I need a mic. <laughs> yeah. But. Okay. Um, I'm asking about yeah. comedians having, tr you know, many comedians. I, I, I believe Jerry Steinfeld yeah. has been one um, that just say that they have a hard time yeah. right. now appearing at college campuses yeah. because of like a PC movement yeah. or something like that. So I, I, I could understand that. It's been a long time since I've been on a college campus more than dropping a daughter off or something like that, right? Uh, but I, I do think this, here's where I guess I'm trying to find in my milk toast moderate uh, approach is this. So I get the movement that engendered this. I get the idea of wanting to create. The concept of trigger warnings is so valid and maybe morphed into areas that might not be as valid as its original 1970s uh, trauma-induced elements there. The concept of safe spaces, I get the basic idea. What I wonder is this, is in an effort to try and be more inclusive, have we been overly protective of people? And that might even be back to when we, in the 80s when we you know, discuss everybody gets a trophy and we want to create esteem rather than earning that. So it's a difficult thing because you know, as an educator, we also study the idea of grit and resilience. And part of me wants to be you know, the, the basis of a, of a liberal arts education should be to be stressed and to be pressed to think differently, not to have confirmation, but to be challenged. So I wonder if when we go to a campus comedy skit, they're pushing boundaries. And sometimes I think they've gone too far. So I'm empathetic to that concern by whether it's Jerry Seinfeld or anybody else. And I don't know the answer because I do think that there's a degree of right and right that's happening. What I don't think is that we're having any sort of core anchor deliberative dialogue about how we address that. Because it tends to be, I'm right, you're wrong. And not an effort, right? This is what I think when I'm reading some of the, the, the ideas about trying to actually understand and not to moralize. 
And we have both features in us and to know when one is needed. Um, yet, to expand our understanding of being sensitive to peoples, that's pretty cool, right? You know, there was a, I had heard a very disturbing, very disturbing, I don't get this one, but, and I don't have direct confirmation of this, this is from another adult saying this, but that uh, there's a certain proliferation in youth using the R word, that word that would be incredibly insulting. And I don't see any reason that that would surface. So I don't mind condemning that word, right? There's a very great difference, right? Um, we know this, the difference between the word calling someone gypsy and Roma. So kids will use that term gypsy because they're innocently unaware. Help them know that there's a more respectful term. You don't judge, you don't condemn. The other one I'm not sure of, you know. Yeah, Mr. Ash, yeah. Oh, okay, yeah, all right, go ahead. Hi, Mr. Donardo. Hey, Matisse. Um, so I just had a question. So um, you said one out of five students know even know about the Holocaust. Yeah, that's what this, yeah. There was a survey done of Europe and a survey done of America. So in the American concept, 22% could not identify the Holocaust. Okay, and then I just wanted to ask, um, what do you think, what's one of the biggest reasons on why um, we it's should a never question. forget the history? So it's a great question because in the same survey, over 90% think their school teaches about Holocaust. <laughs> so it could be, you know, knowing as a teacher, we cover a lot of stuff and maybe I teach something that a week later you forget. I just don't know how you forget the Holocaust. I get it how you don't remember Holly Smoot Tariff. Uh, but I, I don't get how you don't remember that. So it's a great question, but I think this is what it is. The state of Pennsylvania mandates the teaching of the Holocaust, but we don't mandate how you do it. We don't know mandate when. Pennsylvania is very much local control. So it very well could be that we need to think about if, 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 in fact, we will live out the idea of never forget and never again, we better do a better job of education. And whether that's schooling is the, the answer or something else, it, it should be done. Mr. Ash. I got the mic now. Yeah. Um, do you feel the current impeachment process that's going on is going to bring the country together or further <laughs> divide it? I don't think any impeachment has ever brought any the, the nation together ever. So I think that this will likely, um, uh, I, I don't see any way that it'll unite America. Whether, I don't know if it's gonna shift people. Um, if there is significant evidence, you might see some shift, but I, I, I think probably the margin of shift is so entrenched now, right? That we are in a position, there's good and evil in the world, and uh, it is established there. That obviously, if some major uh, event happens, uh, discovery, exposure of evidence, could shift that. But I don't think that will unite the nation. I think it just might give a majority to one side. Ben? Um, I was, thanks for the cool speech. Yeah. Um, hopefully <laughs> I'll be a little bit more on topic than my dad was. Um, okay. Anyways. Um, Hey, you have the freedom to say that, right? <laughs> That's a form of speech. We don't practice democracy. Right, no, no, no. And he can withhold allowance, too. It's all right. Um, anyways, I was wondering if things like the political correctness moving, movement yeah. or the grouping mentality that were designed to promote one's interest in their own self, like to describe themselves, who they are, who they are and promote their being who they are, have, pres have developed more hate speech or have they actually accomplished some their mission in allowing more integration and personal yeah. acceptance. So I think that even the term politically correct to be PC has a degree of pejorative. That, so we want to reject that idea. So the, the origin of it, actually just the etymology, the first time it's been used in American history, I'd like to say, it was by a Pennsylvania named James Wilson, one of the founding fathers, right? And he was on, on the Supreme Court. And he said, it is politically correct. He was challenging the idea of states' rights, that it says, we the people, so the very first time we've used the word politically correct to say that this is a nation of the people first, not the states. And so when we do that, I think that the basic genesis and the origin behind that is to be more sensitive 
I like that idea. But like many things, like the internet, you have a great foundation of it, and it can go to excess when you start to go to these absolutes and judgments. Now, did that create hate speech? Absolutely not. I think we can keep going back long. There, there certainly is a backlash element that people feel you're being told this, right? I think, for example, I think when certain statements are made, for example, when uh, Ms. Clinton said deplorables, that had a counter backlash effect that had more negative than positive for her efforts. Um, should one statement make that? I don't know, but um, the hate existed long before this movement. Any others? Yeah. yeah. Um, so we've seen in the past few years, there's been an increased activism, especially among young people today. Yeah. And that's existed on, say, both sides of the political spectrum. We've seen the climate action rise mm -hmm. that it's mobilized a lot of young people across the world. At the same time, we saw earlier with the, the example you used in the Trump rally of, yep. of the teenagers with the MAGA hats yep. all. Mm -hmm. um, do you think that that surge is indicative of a positive trend where more people are speaking out, say, for climate action or, right. or you know, these, these more progressive ideals? Or do you think that the fact that the surge in activism on both sides would suggest that it is just inherent of a larger divide? Um. So I think, the, I think activism is always good. I think people engaging in this radical experiment of self-government is good. However, when Mike introduced this and talked about the beloved community, so when, when I've been involved in certain circles and people claim that they're involved in civil disobedience but they have done none of the training, none of the cleansing that has to happen, it really does come down to, in my mind, also part of your intent and part of your end goal. So when King described that, right, his end goal is the beloved community. So part of it was he talked about creative tension, creating stress. You go to a sit-in to create stress. You know, the, the song, um, you know, uh, about uh, blocking hallways and how we create difference there. I remember after the death of Antoine uh, uh, um, Anton Jones that, that there were people angry because there were protesters in the streets, right? and because I'm gonna be 15 minutes more delayed to get home. And so you gotta do that to reveal the issue. But the point of doing that, he said, was to achieve negotiation, to talk with your opponent. The point of negotiation is to get to reconciliation. How many Americans in those actions, either side, have a desire of reconciliation? I would argue that most have the idea of victory because I'm right, they're wrong, and the country will be better when my right wins over their wrong. And reconciliation only exists, though, according to King, with justice. Justice is a real difficult task. So that's where I'm not sure, where the activist is so convinced that the worldview is only my worldview. And we need those militants. You know, you need those extremes. Because guess what? They help middle-aged men like me get exposed to things that start to think about it. So I'm not worried that people are like that, but we need more to be the gatekeepers that suggest that you know, this extreme may be okay, this extreme I'm gonna say is unacceptable. And you call out your own family. You don't just say the other side. Yes? So sort of going along what you just said, uh, you talked about people like Alex Jones being sued for yeah. asking questions. Yeah. Do you believe this is going to start steering other people away from stop at? Yeah, so no, um, the, the, the effort of civil lawsuits began, not began, but I think accelerated with a guy named Morris Dees of the Southern Poverty Law Center, who in the last year has had some uh, bad press, uh, deservedly. But he had decided that um, using sort of uh, civil court could, could be it. So the guy showed Tom Metzger. Tom Metzger uh, was an avowed white supremacist. Um, two men in Oregon murdered an Ethiopian, I think it was Ethiopian, immigrant. They're convicted of the crime. But can he be convicted of vicarious liability? Can he be convicted in civil court for money for espousing views? 
And there was a complicated trial going on that he, it showed that he and his son um, had shared newspapers, had pushed these ideas, and it turned out that there's a $12 million settlement for him. Uh, and, and, and the SPLC would then take that money and often they would bulldoze the, the home of a white supremacist because the guy didn't have 12 million, but you got their home. So that became then maybe one answer. If the law was gonna allow free speech, civil court is a little easier to win. It doesn't have the, it's a preponderance of evidence, not uh, reasonable doubt. So that was then the movement. But what's interesting is that means that you don't have to worry about government. I don't know if the lawsuits are going to be that effective in limiting the proliferation of it. They will get damages for a, a victim's family. They will get one person out, but I'm not sure that's going to be enough to get the movement out. Um, and it certainly is a lengthy and difficult process. So I think that it's an option that some people have, but I think it helps us evade the direct causal issues, if that makes sense. Any final questions? Yeah, one, yep, go ahead. Um, okay, so in our current political climate, mm -hmm. uh, where we have this sort of pushback, and I think a very un a good forward step of pushback against hate speech. Uh, where would you draw the line? Like, where do you say you know this is good and this is bad? Especially when proposing legislature on it. Right. So, the, uh, so there are difficulties with that. Vlad, that 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 the difficulty comes in that context often matters. Right. So, in the case of the Connecticut kids singing the rap song with that word, then making up of, they're different moments there, right? And while I don't appreciate the rap song using that word, I think everybody here would suggest that that is different than somebody using the N word in an intentional way to uh, disabuse somebody, right? So to, 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 to defile the nature of somebody. So it's weird that the same word, right, can be um, uh, used based on context. So when we write law, it is very difficult. So that's why uh, many, it, you, you take into consideration that when decisions are made about what is the context. So what I'm looking at though is I don't know if law can be the only answer. Because what you're finding then is that in each state, it'll kind of be based on certain political powers. So you might be emphasizing the left in one state and then emphasizing the right in another state rather than trying to figure out how um, protect from the greatest harm and then develop the culture that says tolerance and celebration of difference. This is a long struggle. This is a need to protect from harm that um, can be legislated, but it won't create that. So w when, when Brandeis is arguing this, that if I tell you you can't say certain things, do you stop believing them? Probably not. And that's where some theorists say you go to embitterment and you find these like-minded communities. Um, do you think that millennials and Gen Zers are more sensitive to terms like man up or are they really offending anyone or are they just a common term? Um, I think that youth is much more enlightened about things and, and maybe at times, yes, might be further than I might Suggest? No, no, no. I think that when you look at, um, when I look at just my own students, and then when I look at surveys of students, I think that the consciousness level of the vast majority, I'm not going to suggest 100%, is far more enlightened than I was when I was their age, far more willing to listen and consider, far more respectful. So I do have that hope. I do worry that in, in a place in which some people are feeling sort of a a need for that carencia, the connectedness, that sense of community, that this is what we find in the white supremacist movement, that these can draw one in. So that's my concern. Not that there would be a conscious move to that, but that you could be drawn in and next thing you know, you're, you know, you're in a place you might not want to be. 
Um, what can we as high schoolers do to stop hate speech? Um, so it's really interesting because I think that uh, it is, adults will tell you this line, right? See something, say something, right? I was with, uh, uh, on the event Mike talked about on the 30th at the library, and older adults were saying, you got to call it out every time you see it. I think that's a bit naive of adults, because my guess is this, that every teenager in here would say that it's very difficult to navigate life as a teenager with social media. And so if you're the one that puts yourself out there, you are out there, and everything that can be challenged via every I don't do social media, but whatever you do with that is there. So I don't know if we can say, yes, be brave, because adults don't always call it out. And maybe it's not a call out culture, right? So I think this. I think that the first thing that I would do and what I'm hoping that our school is going to be doing, I'm meeting with a, a group of kids again tomorrow, is to start to get conversations going. Conversations going about with kids about what their concerns, what their fears, what, because I don't think that people are born in hate. That's my optimism. I am firmly convinced that you are born not a blank slate, but you are born good, and that the world will imprint certain things on you. So if we can discover what those stressors are, I think you could be better at that. I think if you're just gonna say, we gotta stop hate speech, that's not gonna get to it. I think it has to be these long, deep conversations that are finding out What's brought you to this point? So that's a process of cultural shift, though. Yes. Okay. Oh, sorry, I, I'm so, is, is there someone else with the mic? I don't know. I'm sorry. I'm microphone. blinded by the light. It's OK. Um, so this is a little off topic right now, but uh, what do you, as a history teacher, think about, I don't necessarily want to say the censorship of history, but I feel like as a high school student, I don't. I haven't really learned the extent and like kind of the horrible things that have happened in history. And I think that would help increase our awareness a little bit more. But what are your opinions on that? So, um, well, I think, but your, your question is great because it gets to whether we censor you know, our history. So I think the challenge is this. Um, and for 30 years, I have, as best I can, tried to uh, paint a picture of a beautiful nation that is a paradoxical nation that has wonder and pain and wrong. Because I think what we do is this, if we present, that's why this one matters to me a lot, and Jonathan Haidt is the one just a week ago who shared this with me. Because I think if we don't present um, the heroes, so when, when I teach the Holocaust, it's a pretty depressing story. If that's what kids leave with, and not people who stood up and resisted, and people who resisted and failed at it, but people who resisted and thrived, and you see then the extent there, then you get the idea. It's why I love the Civil Rights Movement, because there's so many stories of people refusing, refusing to live in their television world, to quote Phil Oaks, and to say, I need to stand up and change the world, right? Um, Mike was telling me about one of the speakers at his school today before the talk. He works for the city, and he comes in, and he truly believes that local government can do good. And his students, he teaches at uh, Winchester Thurston, they were just, it's infectious, and you're inspired that you can make a difference. Uh, my wife and I took a trip down to the climate change strike because we had that big water main break. And to watch 2,000 people march for what they believed in. It's not my first, but it's, I'm concerned about it, but it's my, not my first topic. But to see 10 Mount Lebanon kids there, you know, I just went back home on the trolley, you know, two feet off the ground, two feet off the ground. Um, and so I would say that I would, you'd never want to hide from the truths. There's not truth, they're truths. But I also would never want you to only explore darkness. Yes. Sir. Hi. Uh, this is a little off, to up to off, or off topic, but I wanted to get Sorry, Mr. Ash started that. Uh, so in the past couple of years, I know that we've uh, seen some politicians like Elizabeth Warren take advantage of ad identifying herself as Native American yeah. and getting into Harvard yeah. Law School. Yeah. Um, I was wondering if you were thinking, um, is affirmative action, has it gone past equilibrium? Is it okay. dividing the country further? 
We definitely have gone off topic. Um, so um, it's a great topic that we explore uh, in my courses here. And, um, you know, my own view is that I do think that we still are at a place that uh, equality of opportunity does not exist. Um, I do wonder that if it creates a perceived negative that we have to be concerned about that. So I think that um, for a university to want a palette that is diverse is awesome. But I think rethinking how we do this because the perception uh, from multiple sides about it has a lot of negativity to it. Um, for me to believe, from my experience, I grew up in a community just next door, fortunate, that equality of opportunity to teach in Mount Lebanon when kids come from poverty, um, we're many steps ahead. And I don't feel guilt about that, but I don't want to be upset when somebody else has a door open considering how many doors have been open for me. So that's my broad view of that. The details we can talk in person, person about specific plans. All right, how about one last question? I have one thing to say hold to on, everybody. Hold on. Get off the couch and vote. <laughs> yes. If you don't do that. <laughs> okay, get off the couch and vote. Absolutely. I'm telling my age because I was in the first group that could vote at 18. We all, we were in high school, we all registered to vote. And voting isn't just the president, it's the school board, it's council, it's... So it, let me pick up on this. So there was a study that just was, uh, came out that um, what leads people to be willing to vote? Uh, most of it was, and our school does a lot of this, involvement in groups when you're young that actually have democratic processes. So getting involved in clubs that have formal processes of an elected officer. We've gone away from doing that a lot. We no longer have that basic experience of the small level democracy. And when you do that, you enrich the large level democracy because the vote itself is, to me, important, but also limited. I'd rather have the voice with it too and going to community meetings and stuff like that. Or run for office yourself. It, not me, but you may run for office yourself, too. So, all right, folks, thank you very much for staying. Enjoy the night. Thank you very much. I appreciate your time. Thank you.